everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 173. I am joined by the ever wonderful, far better looking, finer ass rocking uh, than the <laughs> Rachel guy. Hello, Rachel. Oh, I wouldn't go that far at the moment. It's after Christmas and um, I'm a little bit softer than usual, but that's okay. That's normal. It is normal for Christmas. I was actually, well, I was training yesterday. I'm currently getting PT'd. I've been being PT'd for about two and a half months now. And I walked into um, Ben and I said, Ben, I've got to start training properly again. I'm looking, I'm not. I'm just not looking as athletic anymore. I need to step it up. And it's it's great because I've been through this regression. I've, I've, I've gone back. I've looked at my core strength, my mobility. Like I've improved my function no end. Like my abs work completely differently now. I'm able to communicate my lower abs with my hip flexors properly, rather than my hip flexors doing it. Just loads of stuff. But I said to him, I said, Ben, we've got to start training properly. Like I haven't lifted a, a bar properly or heavily in literally three or four months, and yeah. it, I na- I need that back again. Like I've regressed enough, and I'm like, just give it to me. I need to lift something. Yeah, I feel that too. Like usually when I'm in a gym, actually I was training yesterday, and usually when I'm in the gym, like you know, any time of the year really. Like when I'm doing, particularly if I'm training delts and like I'm doing like that on raises, I can usually see like you know like I get a good pan. I can like see veins in my shoulders, which is kind of sick if you're wearing a dress. But you know if you're in a gym, I think it looks cool. but um, yeah, I was I was training yesterday, and I, I initially I blamed it on the fact that it was really cold and I couldn't get a pump, and then I just realised that I was I was just carrying a bit more body fat. <laughs> but that's okay. Look, look, it's one of those things, right? After you know, you enjoy yourself at Christmas, and you know, there's no, I've got absolutely no guilt associated with it whatsoever. You know, I had a great time at Christmas. I went over to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and saw my family and I was, you know, drinking most days. I was eating bread most days. I was eating dessert most days. Um, so obviously when you're out of your normal routine, you are going to put on weight. So I was eating extra calories that I wasn't burning off. So um, it's, uh, it happens every year and it's, you know, do I, I don't really, I wouldn't even say I diet now coming back into January. I just kind of, I just go back into my normal routine and I don't really think about it too much and then it just kind of falls off. So, you know, you shouldn't make a big deal out of these things. You know, your body's not a robot. It's sometimes you weigh more, sometimes you weigh less and yeah. So there's an important lesson there already that there shouldn't be guilt or issues around all this stuff and it is also good to regress and then, you know, I... I've been happy to regress, but I am now at a point where I have that hunger, not have it back, but I have that hunger in amounts where I, I want to push myself now. I want to go back into that that phase where I'm, I'm working hard towards something physically and a bit aesthetically as well. Like I've lost a bit of my aesthetic. I'm actually, I'm like, Do you know, I kind of want that back again. I miss that. I enjoy looking that way. That's why I worked hard to build that. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't have too much fluff to get around today. Uh, me and Rachel were talking before we started the show. Um, I don't really know what day it is. I'm so busy at the moment. We've got we've rebuilt the academy. Uh, we've been getting new teachers on board. We've got Lane Norton coming on board, Jesse Mundell, Will Hawkins, all these great people to teach people about nutrition on our course. I've got some other big projects coming. I've been working with Gareth Bowler to produce more inspirational videos like the Diet of Disease of the Generation videos, which I hope everyone will support when they come out because I think they're very powerful messages. I've got one coming out soon on goal setting and then I've got a very, hopefully we've pitched it right, potentially uh, controversial video on kids' nutrition. We've done a big inspirational piece on kids' nutrition. I hope we've got it right. We've developed an ebook for people to download off the back of it to help you know, parents understand how to feed their kids better and how to uh, lay a better nutrition on it. So, in the immediate future, that's what's happening in my world, and it's all blending into days and weekends and all sorts. But hey, you know, it's all good. Can I just say, like, okay, so here's the thing, like, going back to you regressing your training, and actually, we're going to kind of touch on this and in, in later on in one of the questions, but you can't have it all at one time, and you almost need to periodize your life in order to get to a certain place. So, you know, you've got a lot of work on at the moment, as have I. Um, You know, you've just redone your your body type nutrition. I've just completely rewritten and revamped and redesigned and everything else, the Athletic Fox Blueprints, the membership site. And there's an awful lot of work that goes into the background. And so, therefore, sometimes 
you know, your, your training does take a little bit of a back seat. And of course, you still prioritize it. You're still going to the gym, but it's not, you're just not working at the intensity that perhaps you would if you were in a little bit more of a, an automation phase of your business. And, you know, that, that comes in, into your training as well. Um, but can I just say, like, Ben, like, congratulations on everything you're trying to do to just improve the health of society in general. And, you know, there's no monetary involvement here. And I just want everyone to know that. Like, there's no, there's no money behind, like, trying to help. You know, this is, it's, it's not about the money when we're trying to help people lead healthier lives in terms of, like, educating people to, to feed their children better and, you know, creating, creating an ebook alone for anybody who's done it. Um, or whoever who hasn't done it is a lot of work, and what might seem very simple on the outside, whatever the simpler the memberships like and the simpler the ebook, the more work has actually gone in behind the scenes to make that happen. So, Ben, credit where it's due. Like, good on you for like just you know continually pushing boundaries and continually like pushing the message to make the world and a, a better and a healthier place. Well, we're both trying, Rachel. We're both trying. Um... Look, you know, you and me got into this industry for a reason. Um, I am lucky enough that there is, you know, cash within a business and stuff to be able to do these types of things, to be able to say, okay, I believe in a message. I'm going to create that message on a more powerful scale. Like, you know, even creating one of these videos with Gareth, it's two days in filming. It's a week in editing. It's refining it over months. We then build an ebook. We attach it. It goes out. It helps people. And it's, you know... it. That's why I got into the industry to help people at a bigger scale, and that's why I got and worked hard to get this show to you know number one um, on iTunes. Because the more people I reach, the more people we affect. It's as simple as that. And yes, I I you know my job is to help people, and I earn money off helping people. But that's not the bigger picture. The bigger picture is is this release of information, um, and I suppose that ties in actually. Uh, I didn't really want to get into a rant. I'm not. I won't get quite into a rant. But this is this is sometimes why it's quite tough to be in our position in the fitness industry because you do get an awful lot of flack. You know, when people oh, yeah. get to certain places, you get an awful lot of discreditation. People dislike it, and this is one of the industries where. And I speak to. You know, I've got several other people um, in you know other businesses that work in different companies and all sorts and I speak to them about their industry and what they experience and I'll give you an example like my brother is a massive fan of beer he loves the brewing world um, craft beer and he's got me into it and I'm absolutely fascinated by the industry because the industry is the one one of the most nourishing industries there is like people collaborate with each other to make beer like the guy down the road doesn't go, oh my God, we need to make a better beer so people drink our beer over that guy. They don't do that. They work together and say, do you know what? You've got an awesome beer. We've got an awesome beer. Let's make a beer together and let's only release 100,000 bottles and let's do a, a, you know, a batch run and getting people excited about our beer. Like I'm just amazed by some of those industries like brewing and stuff where all they do is work together. Like if I love beer... I don't drink just one beer. I'm like, well, I want to try a different one. I want to try a sour one or a bitter one or a hoppy one or whatever. And our industry, wherever you go, it's just, oh, he did that. He said that. He's a dick. His methods don't work. And sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm planning a video about this because it, it does my nut in. But people come up to me and say, Ben, I don't know how sometimes you get through where you are in the industry because it just seems so bitchy the fitness industry and we've just talked about me and Rachel trying to help people and we're trying to help people at the top but all everyone's really doing is bitching mm. and even if I disagree like I might disagree with two three maybe four five percent of Rachel's methods not so much disagree but we might just go about it a different way that's just our journeys us as practitioners whatever but 95% of what we're all doing is the same shit. Yeah. We're all recommending people eat vegetables, to move, to be happy, to drink more, all this kind of stuff. But we focus on that one little thing that that person might have said or is different to ours. And I just think, how do we all expect people to get happier and healthier and believe in us as people and believe in the industry when all we do is bitch and moan? 
Yeah, without going into a, a rant myself, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to hold myself back in. But I completely agree. It's utterly ridiculous. And um, I had somebody on... Oh, well, YouTube is obviously the best place to trolls. And um, I had somebody on YouTube the other day have a... I, I started to, to engage in conversation, which was really stupid of me, um, to tell me that my methods for training females was actually wrong. And I dug a little deeper to find out this guy was a young a young chap, um, obviously hadn't been training for, a, a, you know, a huge amount of time and was, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a very dangerous thing. So he'd obviously, you know, become very well versed in certain uh you know, certain training methods and nutritional methods and everything. And he proceeded to tell me that what I was doing was wrong. And I got pissed at that because I'm like, listen here, little squirrel. <laughs> I think I, I actually referred to him as a little worm. But um, it really annoyed me because I was like, you know what? I've been in the industry for 10 to 12 years. I understand the psychology of the female. And sometimes what I do with my girls is not classic fitness stuff. It's completely left field some, sometimes, but it works. And so for somebody to come in and tell me what I was doing was wrong, somebody who clearly didn't understand the psychology of dieting, the psychology of the female, um, and the, basically the long-term effects of, ch of changing somebody's lifestyle, I found quite offensive. So... You know, it's it's very interesting to you know to see people's perceptions change um, as you grow in, in in your career and in the fitness industry. And quite frankly, I don't care what other people are doing. You know, if it's working, then that's great. Um, keep keep doing what you're doing. But you know, like Ben said, like you know, we don't agree. I it's not that we don't agree, but you know, I guess we 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 have the same outcome in mind, but we just go about it sometimes in slightly different ways and slightly different manners. And that's cool because, you know what, somebody might come to me and I might get them only so far and then they might need to go on to somebody like Ben to just maybe tweak something that's more suited to their personality and more suited to their goals or vice versa. So really, there's no right and wrong way of doing things. There's no black and white. It's just all different sh shades of grey. And you just have to start to learn to accept that some people do things slightly differently and that's cool. I wish I'd kept my mouth buttoned in earlier stages of my career because I remember being that guy on YouTube. Again, a little bit of knowledge, you know, you think you're invincible in the fitness industry. And I remember seeing a shoulder exercise of this guy that had posted online. Now, I'd probably done about flipping 15 minutes of learning properly about how the shoulder works biomechanically. And I proceeded to sort of say, oh, no, you need to do this, and you shouldn't allow the shoulder to move, and you shouldn't allow anterior rotation, all this kind of stuff trying to sound like Billy Big Balls. And this guy was like, oh, actually, no. He was like, you know, I think I'm doing all right here. I've been doing this for like 20 years. And I'm like, no, you're an idiot. And I'm like, at what point did I have the right to even step in and say that? What I should have done is said, Okay, what I've learned is this. Can you please tell me why? So yeah, and, and engage in an actual conversation that allows me to learn off this person if I'm yeah. putting out the, for the information he's putting out there. And whatever career you're in, you do have to spend a period of time just being a sponge. Mm. Being a sponge and just let it all come in. And then when you feel you're rounded and at a point where you can start to talk externally and put your message out there, then do it, but no one learns anything by being a dick about it. Uh, like, and all you do is alienate people. People think, and this is there's this nice clique in the fitness industry that love to talk to each other and go, "Oh, look what he's doing! Look what he's doing! Oh, look what he's just said online! Oh, yeah, what a, what a dick!" And I'm like, you guys are doing nothing, getting nowhere, and helping no one by just bitching and being a little worm about it, as Rachel says. <laughs> We're all here to help people, and all we want to do is moan and fist pump each other, and oh, it's just ridiculous sometimes. Anyway, fuck I it. just say like I, I just really wonder sometimes where people actually have the time to to engage in in, in this stuff. Seriously, yeah. Anyway, so the, the moral of that story is, and I guess that leads nicely into the next the this next the the question that's coming up now is that you've got to just do do your own thing and. St stick to your guns and do things your way. That's, I think that's part of the problem with the modern social media landscape is everyone almost feels now that they have to be public about everything. 
oh, I'm doing this, or this is my new goal, or whatever. Well, it's not a real official goal till I post it on Facebook. Fuck that. Like, sometimes you just got to do things for yourself and saunter along with it. And I just think that is, yeah, it's definitely the negative part of it because people feel bound to letting other people know. It's like, oh, well, let's make it official. Let's put it on Facebook. How about it doesn't have to go on Facebook? You know, it's funny. Um, There is, obviously, with what you and I do, Ben, you know, we have to put a lot of our, a lot of stuff on on social social media and online. And, you know, I, I quite often tell people where I am in the world and what I'm doing and all that kind of stuff. But there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes that, a lot of people don't know about, and I quite like that. You know, I don't post my relationship status online. I, I rarely talk about my other half online, um, just because there are some things that are quite nice to keep to yourself. Mm. And that goes to the same, you know, with, with people posting their goals and, and progress photos and stuff on Facebook. You know what? If you want to show them off and you've done an amazing transformation before and after, that's awesome. Like, go ahead and do it. But, you know, when it's when it's a weekly weekly thing like just question why you're doing it are you actually doing it for accountability because are people actually really keeping you accountable when you're posting online or are you doing it for short-term self-gratification just throwing it out there it's going to be the latter isn't it because no one's going oh that's a nice goal no one's a month later checking in and saying oh how's your you know fat loss or whatever going Your, your close friends might do it but the chances are you'll tell your close friends down the pub when you go out for a glass of wine with them anyway. Exactly. And look, if you're in a forum which is specifically designed for something like that, that's different. But we're talking on a public scale here. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, should we do some questions? Yeah, why not? So when I was reading through the questions this week, uh, I noticed that it's pretty much all for Rachel. Um, so actually, I'm going to turn the tables and I'm going to ask Rachel the questions this week because... Um, I just I just feel it's the right thing to do. Um, so, question number one. Hi, Ben and Rachel. Thanks for your amazing work. I'm still working through back episodes, but I'm making the most of my commute to track up to catch up. Following podcast 171, I wanted to ask a question primarily to Rachel due to your qualifications. I'm a physio in the military and I love my job. However, as I progress, I will do less clinical work and then more admin managerial work, as in many professions. I have considered the possibility of leaving the military in the future and going self-employed so I can continue working with and helping people. I'm also very interested in nutrition, health and well-being, and have started gaining S&C qualifications. My question is, do you think I could combine my work as a physio with nutrition and fitness, or would it be best to keep these separate? Rachel, do you still do any physio work yourself? Any advice is much appreciated. Thanks for helping us all be more awesome. Kat. Um, I love this question, and it's something I literally get asked on a weekly basis. So I'm kind of glad that a question like this has come through to the podcast. Um, First of all, I will say that I'm no longer registered with the CSP, which is the Child Society of Physiotherapy. Um, I don't practice anymore as a physio. I no longer do any hands-on skills. Um, It is something that I have not remained upskilled in due to the fact that I've chosen a slightly different career path. However, having said that, um, physio, that my physio degree and my clinical experience in physio has allowed me to get to where I am um, in my career to date and in the fitness industry. And it's, it's obviously it's given me a massive leg up in terms of um, being very professional at what I do and being able to problem solve, clinically reason, um, and all of the skills that you do learn as a physio. Obviously, from a biomechanicals perspective, um, I find it much easier to look at somebody's training patterns um, and behaviors and then correct those accordingly. Um, I also am able to see... Um, people's weaknesses a lot more easily and a, a lot quicker than somebody, I guess, my age in the industry would. So I definitely found that when I was starting out in my career in the fitness industry, so uh, let's just say I've been in the industry, um, say, five years, so that took me to about um, 25, 26, um, and having the clinical experience that I had, um, I found other trainers who've been in the industry the same, the same amount of time as me, um, and had been through the same different courses, I was still able to pick up movement patterns a lot more quickly and easily and problem solve a lot quicker. So it 
does give you a head start um, in terms of uh, training and strength conditioning. Um, in terms of can you combine the two? Absolutely. There are no rules whatsoever to determine who you can and cannot be. So all of those rules are either self-imposed or they appear to be imposed by governing bodies. So um, I remember when I was looking, um, God, we're going back like 10 plus years now, but when I was looking at coming into the strength conditioning world, um, and I was still a registered physio at the time, um, and I was looking at the, the rules and regulations to set up my own practice, um, I think back then one of the rules was I, I had to have worked in the NHS for, I think it was like 18 months to 24 months um, prior to opening my own practice. Now, whether that would have been heavily imposed, I don't know. But the difference is, is that, you know, all of these rules and regulations are in place to protect clients and patients. So, you know, if you come straight out of physio school, as you know, it's like passing your driving test. You're basically given a license not to hurt somebody. And it's really then from from when you graduate to doing postgrad studies. And obviously you've been in the military. And um, so you'll be used to working um, in a slightly different environment, potentially with more acute injuries. Um, I worked with a lot of military physios when I was working in intensive care. And they were fantastic physios and they were very, very well trained. Um, so you do learn in your career after you've graduated. So I, I fully believe that that's why, you know, those rules and regulations are in place. However, having, you know, having had the experience that you've had, there's absolutely no reason why you cannot set up your own business as a physio and you can still practice as a physio and you can still keep your registration alive and kicking and still um, continue your CPD. So you continue professional development. Um, but your CPD can also involve strength conditioning courses. It can involve nutrition, um, fitness, and um, basically whatever you want. Because to my mind, in my opinion, as a trainer now, would I refer to somebody like you? Hell yes. You would be first, the first person on my list to refer to if I had a client with an injury. Because now not only do you understand the clinical skills, you've also bridged the gap between that gray area of end stage strength conditioning and acute rehab. So you are the complete package. And in my opinion, we definitely need a lot more professional people coming, you know, potentially who want to come out of, um, come out of the military or come out of working as a physio and come into the private sector and set up your own business. Like I said, there's no rules on your career path. You can call yourself whatever you want to. You're a physio who specializes in strength conditioning. Awesome. Guess how many referrals from athletes you're going to get? A lot. Guess how many referrals from people who are at that end, you know, who are trainers themselves looking to extend their own knowledge and you can mentor trainers. There's like, there's a world of opportunity open for you outside of the military. And, you know, that, that's how I conclude this. There are no rules. You make the rules and you decide how you progress. The only thing I would add to that is when you do decide or if you do decide to become self-employed, don't be that uh, person or practitioner that sort of creates a leaflet and business card that says, I do S&C and personal training and nutrition and lifestyle coaching and rehab and all this stuff and list it all because people don't come to people like us for that reason or not many like yeah people will come to you for a massage or they'll come to a uh, physio if they're in pain people come to you for like a reason so you've got loads of skills just like I've got loads of skills Rachel's got loads of skills we package them in a way to help people with particular problems or to get to a particular end goal and I just happen to know or you just happen to know you know physio biomechanics lifestyle mindset all this stuff so just package yourself as a coach as something a bit more intelligent than just, I do all this, come and see me. Because people don't buy that. They buy results. Mm. They buy an end goal. They buy, buy the benefit of you know seeing you as a practitioner because you can tie all of this into their journey. I'm actually seeing somebody at the moment. I'll, I'll use an example. Um, I said to him the other day, I said, what do you actually call yourself? And he said, well, I call myself an exercise specialist. And I was like... That, that still doesn't quite cut what he does. Like, he is so specialised in what he does. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I'm very hypermobile. Um, since I tore my hamstring, um, you know, two years ago, I've had a lot of problems with my hips and, and my lower back due to hypermobility issues. 
and I haven't been able to fix myself and so and I've seen various different coaches and, and physios and chiros no one's really been able to help me so I started to ask around about who the best person in London was to help me with my issues and this guy's name kept coming up time and time and time again so eventually I went to see him and he is very good and his his skills and his qualifications are so varied but what he does is he specializes in himself as an exercise specialist so what he does is basically tweak exercises and, and fine-tune them so much and he uses um, MAT so muscle activation technique and a very a, a bunch of other different tools in order to progress somebody forward and it might be such small baby steps and so that's what he specializes in and he works with people who are generally speaking um already you know fairly fit and active and really just want to keep fine-tuning and fine-tuning so that's his like little niche there so you do have to find your own niche and start there and you know it's one of those things that will probably grow with time and it will probably change over time um I just remember a really good tagline that um, one of my mentors used to use and he was um, head of strength conditioning for um, a rugby team in, in Wales and, and his tagline was exercise with intelligence and you know he had a master's degree he had everything else that went on behind it and it exactly, that's exactly what it was is exercise with intelligence so coming up with a tagline something like that something that you truly believe in um, and like I said remain open because that probably will change over the course of your career. Nice, right, question number two. Yes. Hey Ben and Rachel, I followed you for a while but just recently got into the podcast. You and Rachel do some amazing work and your views of mindset and total lifestyle have really inspired me. Good. Uh, my question is about making improvements in multiple aspects of fitness at the same time. I play college football, soccer in the US and high a high level of strength and power in addition to good cardiovascular fitness is required. Our season ended in November and since then I've been lifting two to three times a week, playing indoor soccer pretty often and running a few times a week. My problem is that I've noticed I'm having trouble improving my cardiovascular strength and my absolute strength and power. For example, right after this season has ended, I would run almost every day and had trouble making progress on my lifts. In the last month, all my lifts have shot up I played indoor soccer today for the first time in a while and had a lot of trouble doing the repeated sprints that were involved. How do I how do I balance strength training, cardio and plyometric speed training to get the best of each? At the moment I feel like I'm mediocre at each one and I'm not sure where I'm going wrong. Sorry for such a long question. I'm just really not sure how to handle this. Thanks for everything you guys do. Jeff Picard. Um, cool, this is a good question. It's very much a strength conditioning based question. Um, I'll be brutally honest here, you, you, you can't you can't do everything and you can't get the most out of everything at one time. So um, I'm just throwing this out there um, and I haven't trained um, soccer players. Um, I've trained rugby players and, and MMA athletes, but I've not trained soccer players. However, I have a lot of friends in the industry who have. And I'm just throwing this out there, but and I fully believe that, obviously, strength training is really important in any sport. But if you're looking at soccer, as an example, unless you're, like, I don't know, captain spaghetti arms and getting, like, pushed off the ball at every given opportunity, then strength training, and particularly, like, absolute strength and power, you, you, don't, need, you don't necessarily need that side of it. And so I'm just perhaps suggesting that you know, I know a lot of soccer players also like to look good, and I'm knocking that because I train also for aesthetics, but are you training to look good, or are you actually training specifically for your sport? Because I just want to address that as well, uh, uh, firstly. So basically, when we're looking at, at, you know, at training for sport, and this is basically like athlete training in general, you have to periodize your programming. And by periodizing your programming, what that means is that there are going to be certain times of the year where you focus on particular skills or particular aspects of your sport. So as an example, you can't be improving your cardiovascular strength and training for absolute strength and power at the same time simultaneously. They just don't work hand in hand. What you can do is periodize them. So you basically go through a three or four week block of one 
and then the other, and then the other, and, the, and then the other, because what we're essentially doing is basically trying to improve your baseline level of each of them to build a better athlete. So an example would be, um, let's have a look, you, you know, you were talking about your in-season and your off-season. In your off-season, how you might periodize it so that, say, for example, you do need to put on a bit of size, or, you know, you, let's be honest, you want a lift to look good. Like, that's going to be, as soon as you come into your off-season, that's going to be, I guess, your, how do you call it in fitness industry, your classic bulking phase. And I say that in inverted commas. You know, that's going to be the time where um, you don't do quite as much cardio. Um, you know, you might still throw an interval session here and there. But predominantly, most of your time is going to be spent in the weight room, um, perhaps on a surplus of calories. Um, you know, you're, you're still going to be um, tying in interval training here and there, but it's not going to be the sole focus of your training for those first four weeks, three to four weeks. Can extend it up into six weeks if you needed to. And then we look at your off-season phase in general. Um, you know, you might go from your, your bulking phase to then your next phase. You may be starting to introduce some pliers. Um, or some, you know, sports specific and skill specific movements into that um, intermediate phase, and then towards the end of that phase, when you're coming into pre-season training, that's when you may start to up your cardio training and sort of drop off the weights a little bit. When I say drop off the weights, I don't necessarily mean lift lighter weights. It may just be reducing the volume of your weight training in that time, and then increasing the volume of your cardio training. So, in a nutshell. You know, I, I will, and this is very, very common in athletes, like you're training for a sport and not for the cover of a magazine. And Jeff, that might have nothing to do with you whatsoever, but I'm just addressing that because it is very common. And I've you know, I've worked with some pretty high level athletes. They still want to look good, which is great. And But sometimes you have to put your sport ahead of that. And so Jeff, that may not apply to you at all, but you know, for everybody else listening to this, are you training for your sport or are you look are you training specifically to look good? Because sometimes the two do not work hand in hand, depending depending on what the sport is. So that is essentially how I'd answer that question. You have to periodize, set things out so you, you so you prioritize um, certain aspects of your training um, during particularly using your off season um, in particular and during your um, during the season um, you might do a, a, a lower volume of weight training and uh, focus on skills development. And really, if this is, it sounds like you're pretty committed to your sport. You really yeah. enjoy it as a, you know, I'll, I'll call you in a high level amateur athlete, just mm -hmm. judging by the question that you've written. Maybe it's time to get a coach. Maybe it's time to have that, that, that guiding hand to say, no, we're going to do six weeks of this, three weeks of that, etc. Because, you know, like if I get in the gym and start focusing on my aesthetic side of things, something else is going to go. Like I can't, I can't do everything. If I want to focus on my endurance, which is something I need to focus on at the moment um, with my positioning uh, in my sport. Like something else has got to give. There's only so many, so many, tra so many training hours in a week. Sorry, um, and only so much I can fit in. So unfortunately, we just can't be good at everything. And that is, I suppose, the beauty of being an amateur athlete is that you tend to be all right at kind of all things. And that is why we're amateur athletes. Like if I was amazing at strength and power and I was big, then I might be a prop forward and that would be my specialty. My specialty wouldn't be cardiovascular, wouldn't be skills, and I would focus on my strength and power because that is my key skill acquisition to be a top-level athlete. So top-level athletes are rarely good at everything and they specialise in a discipline or a certain area. Like if you're a striker, you're usually potentially very skillful, very quick on the ball, got good agility and vision whereas if you're a defender you might have more foresight you know more more more, more absolute power more size more bulk that kind of thing thing and a little bit less skill so the the tables always shift where we are the strongest and you're just never going to be good at everything you know there's only a few people like that the Ronaldos the Messis you know the people that are godlike that could probably play in any position they they have these skills but there's not many of them people around I think Ronaldo is the only footballer I know because he's fit. Like, he's the only one I know. I'm not into football, obviously, but Ronaldo is hot. Just putting it out there. Anyway, for the girls out there. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Question number three. Hi, Ben. Firstly, I love listening to podcasts, particularly the Q&As with Rachel. The banter is hilarious. <laughs> oh, yes. um, and, and the honesty is amazing. 
Your recent change in focus towards mindset and well-being has spurred me to write this email. I'm sorry if this has already been covered. I'm a little behind. I'm in my final year of school doing A2 exams. I've applied to do sports science at uni and have four offers, all either AAB and ABB. I'm struggling in school. I'm no longer enjoying my subjects and I'm struggling in a couple of them to get the grades I require to get into uni, but I'm working on it. I've been under lots of pressure at school and got and quit my first job last term. I've not been in the greatest place since the end of October slash beginning of November. However, at the start of December, things started to feel a lot worse and I started to have thoughts about self-harm and later did self-harm. Since then, I've been to the GP and have have been told I'm suffering for acute stress and mild depression. Over the Christmas period, I decreased my activity level, like everyone, and I'm struggling to get my training mojo back some days. Back. Some days I don't really want to get out of bed. I was wondering how to get my mojo back and how I should factor in my mental health into the intensity and training and my nutrition. I've lost my appetite a bit recently and been eating very little. Once again, so much for the great content. Hope you can help. Many thanks. Uh, well, I think we could all at some stage relate to being in school and doing your A-levels. Um, I was the first year actually that had to do to go through the new A-level system. So, so the A1s and A2s and I can, you know, I read this question and I, I it just brought me back to, to literally those days. Um, and I can completely relate to, to the stress, um, that this person is going through. So when we discuss this question, I guess the first thing I'll say is this is just like a general chit chat and general advice, but you need to seek professional help for this. So um, we all deal with stress in, in various different ways. And when you're in an acute period of stress, you don't have the resources available to you to sometimes think rationally. So you need you need help. You need somebody. You need to seek help from a professional to to help you manage your stress effectively and um, cope a, a little bit better. So that's the first thing I'll say: see a professional. So, like I said, everyone deals with stress in different ways. For example, um, my RBS always flares up when I'm in a period of stress. Um, and how do I manage that? Um, well, through years of experience, I know that when my IBS flies up, that is that means that I'm in a very stressful situation and I need to do something active about it. However, what I would say here is you have to really think about your life uh, and your life vision and long term where you actually see yourself. And this is quite like it's quite a deep thing to go into, particularly when you're 17 or 18. And, you know, you're really just starting out your career, really. You know, you, you've applied, you've got four offers to, you know, for sports science. You have to really ask yourself some quite serious questions here. And that's, is this really what you want to do? Because if this is a passion of yours that has been long standing for such a long period of time and it hits your life vision and you know that, you know, your future is destined in sport and this is something that, you know, you've been thinking about and dreaming about since you were a kid and it's, you know, it's it's your one thing that you are absolutely passionate about, then the stress that you're going through now needs to be managed more effectively, yes, but to get to where you want to be in your life vision, inevitably that is going to incur periods of stress. So we need to look at, if that is the case, so if this is your life vision, then we need to look at how best to manage your stress right now. And one of the things that I would suggest is um, learn to have um, a little more balance um, on a day-to-day basis. So an example would be um, I implement jam, what I call jam sessions um, with everybody who I mentor. So a jam session is um, a study or a work period of anywhere between one hour to 90 minutes, depending on your attention span. And after which you actually walk away from your computer and you have a scheduled half an hour of downtime. And that half an hour of downtime might include going for a walk, getting some food, 
um, having a little bit of Facebook banter, whatever it is, but it's it's scheduled time where you're not actively working because what you'll find is that you're actually more productive during that time than if you were to just set yourself a period of five hours and try to work solidly for five hours because we've all been there, we've all done it, it doesn't happen. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that all of the pressure that you're under right now is self-imposed. So when you get to the stage where, you know, to get two A's and a B at A level, um, you've got to work down hard for that. And because you are, you have been putting so much pressure on yourself, you also feel that you can't, you know, you're starting to second guess yourself now. So by having, giving, cut yourself a little bit of slack, you're doing really well, you're doing a good job, you know, you, to, to get an offer for two A's and a B and an A and, or an A and two B's means that you've pr- done probably pretty well already in your AS levels, if they still call them that, AS's, A1's, I can't remember. So your first year of, of A levels. So start to, to cut yourself a little bit of slack, but that would be like my, my very much my general advice there. And the second thing is, is if you thought long and hard about this, and you're not completely, utterly over the moon passionate about sports science and your life vision being in sport. Is it such a bad thing right now to really have a good think about why you're doing what you're doing? I'm just throwing it out there, and it might be it might be that it is that it is part of your life vision. You're perhaps just not in a, a state to cope with this right now, and perhaps you need a couple of months out. And then you can go back and revisit it next year. And I remember so well being in your shoes and, and being 18. And if I'm if I'm really honest, one thing that one of my I wouldn't say one of my regrets, but if I had my time again, um, I wish I'd applied and I wish I'd done medicine at uni. Um, because I wanted to become a doctor. And the reason that I didn't, I didn't apply for medicine. It not, had nothing to do with the grades, but it was purely the fact that my medical degree would have taken me five years. And back when I was 18, I was like, wow, like, you know, that would mean that I wouldn't graduate until I was like 23. And at the time, like 23 seemed so old to me. Um, and now I look back and I'm like, fuck, 23, like 24, God, like I could have stayed at uni till I was 24 easily. And so what seems like, and I don't want this to appear condescending, I'm just speaking purely from experience, my experience of being at university and my experience of being a perfectionist at school and putting that much pressure on myself at school as well. And I I can only relate to the amount of stress that you're under. Um, It's not as serious as it appears to be. And there is always time. So if you need a little more time to get through this, if you need six months out, then that's cool. Take six months out. What feels like impossible, like if you took six months out now to go and do something else and just have a little bit bit of downtime to nurture yourself, really find out sort of what your next steps are. It's not the end of the world. And what might appear to be the end of the world and you 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 will think that you're failing doing it, you're absolutely not. So also that's an option for you. And like I said in one of the previous questions, it's you who determines your future and your outcome. And like, don't be fooled into thinking that if you don't do your A-levels when you're 18, you can't do them and therefore you can't go to university. Some of my best friends at university were mature students. And when I say mature students, they came in at 23, 24 to do a degree. Um, and I was, you know, I was, 20, I was just in 21 by the time I graduated. So really age is nothing. Um, and so... Really, that's that's all the advice that I can give on that is go and see a professional. And um, you know, if you need help with a referral, Ben and I can help you with that. Um, but yeah, that would be my advice. Anything to add? Yeah, aside from Rachel's advice, which is spot on, I want to go a little bit deeper. And um, this is something that people I feel don't, you know, genuinely appreciate is that being a human is an incredible thing Mm. like what we can do as people and the life that we're able to leave is genuinely incredible like you know i've 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 had conversations like for example even with my girlfriend like if we ever had a kid and for some reason that kid uh was impaired and disabled or anything like that i've always tried to envision how that would feel as a person and i how i would feel because 
it does in a way, um, you know, and I don't want to sound condescending, it, it limits opportunity from the perspective that you don't have optimal. Like right now I have all my limbs working, I'm functional, I'm healthy, I'm happy, all that kind of stuff. There's nothing, you know, per se wrong. And I couldn't imagine not being in that position. And the reason why I say that is because I believe whatever, wherever you are, I don't believe everyone or people fully appreciate how amazing a gift life is. Mm. And this really hit home to me and I tried to hit it home uh, last night. So I went to Royal Holloway and I did a, a talk to um, all the students there, all the students who wanted to turn up and hear me speak. And I did a, a talk mainly around kind of like nutrition, health, lifestyle and a little bit about getting the, the best out of life. And the guy got up at the end to kind of say thanks for coming because it was Mental Awareness Week at the university. And the university had put on loads of like lectures and help and, and scenarios and groups you could join. And everyone just then started to get up. And I was like, hang on, I'm not having any of this. And I asked everyone to sit down again. And I said, what you guys realise in the room right now is you're shaping your whole life. You're making decisions that are going to put you into a place where a career, you're going to meet someone that you might have a relationship and kids with. Like this is shaping everything. And you have to realise the the, the magnitude and the reason why I say this is because I know loads of people that I go to uni with that are unhappy mm. they're not in jobs that they enjoy they're not doing things that they're passionate about and for me that is really sad mm. I graduated uh, with a year of about I think it whittled down from about 160 to 120 people out of about 120 people I think there's about five or six people working in the health and fitness industry mm. that's like Less than 5% are actually doing the job that they trained to do. So people went to uni, not passionate about a subject, didn't really know what they wanted to do. And by the way, I'm not discrediting not knowing what you want to do. That is yeah. not a problem. That's but cool. don't put yourself in a position where you are committing to something that you don't want to do. So mm. when I left school, I wanted to be an actor. I then realized I didn't want to be an actor. But I didn't then put myself under pressure to say, I now need to know what I want to do. I didn't know. So the only thing I could do was chill out. So I left school, I got a job. I got a job in a print factory, delivering um, leaflets and working on the printing presses and helping out the guys. It was a great job. I was a bit of, I was free as a bird. I drove around in a van, I delivered leaflets and at the weekend I worked in a bar. And then I started to get fit and healthy. And then I developed a passion for fitness. I lost all my weight. I did all this cool stuff. And then I was like, that's it. I'm going to be in the fitness industry. I'm going to help other people. And my passion just evolved. And I didn't put any pressure on myself. I was destined to leave school and go to drama school for three years and try and pave my way. That didn't work out. So I didn't say, shit, I need to go to uni and do a history degree because I need a degree. Life is so important. And if you're sitting here right now, I've excluded your name because I, I know it's a bit of a sensitive question. If you're sitting there right now going, do you know what? I'm stressed out because I've got to get grades to get into a degree that I don't want to do. You need to back out. Mm. You're going to commit three years of your life to doing a subject you're not passionate about. I don't want you to be that guy where I looked around in my lecture theatre at uni and all these faces were just saying, I don't want to be here. And I was mm. thinking, why are you guys being here? I'm still in 20 grand worth of debt for my uni degree. Mm. That debt is sitting over my head, but I am fine with that because I went to uni for a reason. I mm. went to uni to learn and shape my craft, to gain opportunities, to do internships, to shape my life, and I'm proud and glad that I did it. Yeah. But if I was someone that now had a 20 grand um, debt on something that I didn't even want to do, and I'm not even doing it anymore, that's sad. Yeah. That you can't put yourself in that position. Life is a gift. Do stuff you're passionate about. And if you can't find your passion, just chill out. Just get a job. Do something. Focus on the things in your life that you are happy and passionate about. Like your health, your family, your friends, your social life. And stuff happens for a reason. You have to cultivate this mindset in life that things do happen for a reason. Sometimes I don't know why things have happened. And in the last six months of my life, personally, business, professionally, whatever, various things have happened, people have moved on, things have happened. And do you know what? I've said to myself, oh, why has this happened? Have I done something wrong? Has this happened? Is this not the path? And do you know what? It always transpires that it is the best thing. 
maybe mm. for me or the other person or whatever, but it just happens. And sometimes you've got to be patient. You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to enjoy the journey. And that's why we always say like the fat loss journey, it's not really a lot of the time by reaching the end goal. It's about that journey of learning stuff about yourself, evolving, learning skills, nurturing your body and mind. So it's a lot more than all this. And this is why, you know, I've talked a lot more about from a motivational perspective. And I love talking to uni students is they are on the cusp of the rest of their life. They're now making decisions that will shape the whole of their career. And if you don't put yourself in the right decision, then you only lead yourself to a life that will not be as happy as you want it to be. And, you know, just to add there, that I I loved my physio degree. Like, I've, I've switched careers. I've sw- I, don't, I don't practice anymore. Like, I loved, I loved university. I had the best time. I loved my degree. But, you know, when I came out and I was working as a physio and I had everything, I had all of the things that, you know, in all the material stuff in life that should make me happy you know I had a lovely house in you know in Birmingham I had a great job I had a, a nice car I had a very nice lifestyle but I was fundamentally unhappy and when I decided that I don't want to be a physio anymore my parents actually fully supported that because they could actually see how unhappy I was um but I got, I got bombarded with people saying oh why have you given up physio like you know you you were really good, like, you know, you were so smart and this, that and the other. And I'm like, well, I'm still effing smart. You know, I'm, I'm still smart, but I just don't, I don't enjoy what I'm doing. So I've had to change it. And so forget other people's perceptions of, of you know, of you and, and what you want. You have to make the best decision for you. And regardless of whether you, you know, you change your career and you change your lifestyle now or whether you do it after you've graduated, because at university is really good fun, let's be honest. Um, and But you have to really want to be there. Because trust me, like after a sports night on a Wednesday night, when you have to turn up to, to lectures on a Thursday morning, like you've got to really want to be there to go with that hangover. Trust me, sports night is epic. Mm. God, those memories, how oh, they flood back. <laughs> and, and this is where, you know, when we talk about mindset sometimes, people think that there's only like one mindset to be in. Or you can only cultivate a particular mindset. But the beauty of crafting and going through these processes of and, and nailing your perception of the world is to be able to have multiple mindsets that merge into one. So I'll talk about one mindset. And we talked about like haters and Facebook and goal setting and stuff at the beginning of this podcast. A great mindset to be in is not to give a fuck. But that doesn't mean that you don't care and are not passionate about things in life. It just means that you use that part of your mentality and your mindset to distance yourself from some of the negativity in your world. Like I'm just about to read a book. Let me turn around and get the title. Uh, the Life-Changing Man- Magic of Not Giving a Fuck. I'm about to read that book. And I've read several books on a similar topic before. I've read the book Fuck It. It's a brilliant book. And I'm now reading this one. And the reason why I, ne- I feel I need to read another book is because I need to reframe in my head some of the stuff that's happening in my life. Like I'll give you, you know, I get an awful lot of flack in the fitness industry. People bitch behind my back. They, they moan about various different things. That's just part and parcel of what I do, you know, the success that the podcast has had, etc., whatever. So I need to reframe that part of my brain that suffered a little bit because I haven't had that kind of stuff for a while and I need to help that. But, but just because I'm putting my focus there, it doesn't mean I... I leave behind like my passion, the reason why I get up every day, my, my general motivation for my life. None of that disappears. I'm just adding. Nothing is ever leaving. You're adding. So sometimes we have to go through these processes to just, just keep adding to our mindset like we do our bodies. We add a different bit to our body. We add more fitness. We add more muscle. We, you know, we take away fat. We build, and that's why this podcast has been through a massive journey. We are helping you build yourself as people. Because I want you all to have an awesome life. Mm. The title of my university talk last night was How to Be Awesome. That's it. Because if I walk into a room full of students and say, oh, all you guys should stop eating crisps and eat broccoli. Every one of them is just thinking, who is this guy? Mm. I need to create a connection with you people as to why I want you to eat healthy, why I want you to train. Why I want you to get your mindset right. Why I want you to go to bed on time. And all of this links back to, I want you to live an awesome life. 
I want you to be happy, I want you to be healthy, I want you to feel awesome every day, I want you to be passionate about your job, passionate about the people around you. That is life. That's why we're on this planet. To be awesome, to feel awesome. That's what I call chasing life. There we go. Right, rant over. Woo! <laughs> and I know you've got to go. You said quarter past nine. It's like two minutes to go. I do, but we'll save this next question to the next one because it's we a will. really good one and I, I've got a really good answer for it. We will save this question. Um, right, me and Rachel are off. Honestly, look, don't ever let me meet you, you, the listener, and not see you apply this information. You've just given up 55 minutes of your time to listen to us help try to help you use this information don't think oh well maybe apply it i'm i am god awful serious that you are on this planet to live an awesome life period done and if you're not living an awesome life i want you to go and think about what you want to change and that change might take five years you might be in a place where that change can't happen you might be in a pickle with young kids going through a messy relationship and a job you don't hate. There could be loads of shit going on. And I can sympathise with that. You just have to create a longer term goal. Mm -hmm. Things might not happen overnight. Right, me and Rachel are off. Thank you, Rachel. Been amazing as ever. Thanks, Benny. Go cheese like people. We will be back in two weeks' time. I will be back on the podcast next week with Mr. Rob Wolf. <sighs> Who for me is a massive legend. I'm going to get an update on his thought process in the kind of paleo, ancestral nutrition, that kind of world is a guy that I have a massive amount of respect for. Very anyway, cool. um, we are off. Thank you very much for listening. Please talk to us on things like Twitter and Facebook. Communicate. We're here. We love to talk. Um, otherwise, go away and promise me you're going to try and be awesome. Ciao. Ciao. Hey everyone, Bank Cooper Radio, episode number 172. We are well into 2016. If you are on the ball and you listen every Thursday and you engage in the show, uh, welcome into 2016. I hope it's going as you planned. I know me and Rachel have talked an awful lot recently about goal setting, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And you know, we don't we don't say this stuff for no reason. It's 